Now, yeah. do, do you go for long country walks? I can't walk at all, you see. I'm really rather lame now. Did you enjoy that when you were younger? No, I simply hated it. You've never liked exercise? Never. Now, what about music? Are there particular pieces of music which give you special comfort when you're feeling overstrained? I don't know comfort, but excitement. You see, I have been, in my life, very much influenced by the works of Mr. Stravinsky. And he... Favourite composer, if you have to turn to music in a moment of strain, would it be to Stravinsky? No, I suppose that it would be to Bach and, be and a Mozart, but certainly Mr. Stravinsky amongst them, but more for excitement than for being soothed, you see. Um, tell me a little now about the way in which you work. Do you, for instance, write your poetry uh, at regular hours, or do you have to sit and wait for inspiration to come upon you? Oh, I sit and wait for inspiration. Yes, of course, one do, is obliged to do that. Do you work, in fact, a certain number of hours every day, or does waiting for inspiration mean that you often go for weeks without working? Uh, no, it doesn't mean that, because it means that if I haven't an inspiration, then I'm producing a poet's notebook, uh, quotations from, from various, what well, various poets, various painters, and various musicians have said about the arts, which will cast uh, some reflection on poetry. So that your uh, work you do do at regular hours, even if not poetry? Indeed, yes. Yes. Do you type your own writings or do you dictate? No, write no them I hand? write them. I write them myself. And send them to be typed afterwards? Yes. Do you revise your work many times? Oh, yes. When I write poetry, you see, I mean, I must sometimes have a, almost a whole notebook full of quite a short poem. You're writing many, many drafts? Oh, yes. And sometimes I will put them aside. And poetry, I think, has two parents. Uh, sometimes the first parent will appear, and you have to wait for the second parent. Damien, are you a shy person? Extremely. Are you enjoying yourself now, or is it torture? I like talking to you. Uh, I don't always like talking to people because I am shy of them. If I think I'm boring them, you see, it is dreadful for me. You asked me, just now you said that people's idea of me was that I was eccentric and, sa and uh, savage? No. Forbidding, forbidding, I said, and dangerous. Well, I don't think I'm forbidding, except in when I absolutely refuse to be taught my job by people who know nothing about it. I have devoted my whole life to writing poetry, which is to be a form of religion. And I'm not going to be taught by people who don't know anything about it. I think it's very impertinent. I mean, I don't uh, teach plumbers how to plumb. Just so. Well, now, I want to take you back to your childhood. Is it true, it's always said, that you had an unhappy childhood? Extremely unhappy. Why? Because you were a girl? Partly. And also because my father and mother, you see, they married without knowing anything about life at all. They were quite young. My mother was 17. And poor thing, she didn't know anything about life. She was just made to marry my father. And they just didn't understand the first thing about each other. What sort of woman was she? She was very beautiful. Uh, she had the most terrible rages. Which, oh, well, I've forgiven her so long ago. And what about your father? He was a notable eccentric now. What do you remember? Oh, well, him? wild eccentric. When I was a child, I was fond of him. Uh, only between the ages of... 13 and 17, because he was then kind to me. But then he suddenly turned round on me. I've never found out why. Did you realize when you were a small child how eccentric he was? I hardly saw him. So that his eccentricity didn't embarrass you at all? No, I saw far too much of my mother. Now, what was it about her that you didn't get on with? Well, of course, I was a changeling, you see. She when treated I... you as if you were, as if you were. Well, when I was born, she would have liked to have turned me into a doll. And it was a great disappointment, of course, to them that I was not a boy. If I'd been Chinese, I should have been exposed on the mountains with my feet bound. Is it, <laughs> in fact, true that both your parents uh, disliked your appearance as a child? Uh, my father, I don't think my mother bothered about it. My father loathed it. He liked people covered with curls and, quite frankly, rather common. You see, he'd married a lady, and it hadn't gone very well. So, of course, he didn't want any more ladies about. 
Uh, and is it true that he tried to change your appearance, that he, that he had recourse to plastic surgery? Oh, oh, yes. What happened about that? Tell me. Oh, well, it was very dreadful. I don't want to talk about it. Right. Were you, as part of this unhappy childhood, were you punished or were you teased? What was the particular form of torture? Uh, well, I think they resorted to everything which could possibly humiliate or hurt me. Uh, including, for instance, spoiling your brothers at your expense? Well, my brothers would never allow that to happen if they'd known. You see, my brother Osbert is five years younger than me. My brother Sir Sheffield is ten years younger than me. And we're an absolutely devoted family. I mean, you couldn't find a more devoted um, trio, you see. Looking back now on your childhood, who were the real friends that you had at Venishaw in those days of extreme youth? Well, when I was a small child, my dear old nurse was wonderful. And then there was the fascinating Henry, who came of a long line of whalers, and who was the first of all footman and then butler. And he came when I was two years old. He used to button up my shoes, you see, for me, when I was put into a, a perambulator. And he would always, in afterlife, uh, come to me and say to me, look out, miss, you better get out of the back door because her ladyship's coming for you. Now, you've brought out of all this at least a love of the countryside. How much of the, uh, of the ordinary life of the country did you see living at Renishaw in your childhood? Did you love the animals, for instance? Well, until my brothers were born, my only companions were birds. Any particular pet birds, I mean, or the wild birds in the woods? Well, I loved the wild birds, but my pet birds, there was a peacock you see and he and i loved each other very much and i was four years old and he would always he had a kind of feeling for time he would fly up to the um, leads outside my mother's bedroom and when i went to say good morning to her and when he saw me he would give a, a harsh shriek and at that moment i didn't like uh, didn't dislike ugly voices as i'm afraid i do now and he would then wait for me until I came out again, when he would give another scream and fly down into the garden and wait for me. We would then walk round and round the garden, as you might say, arm in arm, excepting he hadn't any arms. I would have my arm round his neck. I was four years old. And I was asked why I loved him so, and I said, because he's proud and um, uh, has a crown and is beautiful. And then my father got him a wife with his usual tactlessness, after which he never looked at me again. My heart was broken. That was your first disillusion, perhaps? My first disillusion. Was that before or after you ran away from home? Oh, it was before I ran away from home. I ran away from home when I was five. And I couldn't um, put on my boots, unfortunately. And so I was captured at the end of the street and brought back by a policeman, whom I hit as hard as I could. But I was restored. Now, when and how did you eventually escape from this closed family circle? Well, when I was 25, I was let out on ticket of leave. To do what? Oh, well, I, it wasn't possible for me to remain at home. Were you given enough money to make the t ticket of leave a, a very rewarding one? Oh, no, no. Um, you see, my father lived in the 13th century, where, I mean, a groat was quite a lot, you know what I mean. Yes. Now, have there been any other writers in recent generations in your family? Not in recent generations, well, no. It, does it strike you as odd that your one generation should produce, have produced three writers of such distinction as you and your two brothers? Well... We are descended collaterally from several people. We're descended, you know, collaterally from the Herberts. Yes. And um, Lord Herbert of Cherbury is a greatly underrated poet. He's written some wonderful poetry. And there's one poem which is called um, uh, Of White Hair or something like that. Uh, I forget the name at the moment. And it might have been, it's a most wonderful uh, poem. It's about a girl with very fair hair. And it might have been written by my brother, Sir Sheffield. Yes. Well, the question, of course, that I really want to ask you is, do you think that any of you would have had the careers you have had if it hadn't been for this extraordinary childhood? Did it help you in the long run? I think it came partly from my father's 
a queer intellectuality and coldness, and for my mother's wild fire, passion, and impossible temper. All your professional life, I have the feeling that you particularly, but your brothers as well, have been campaigning. You've been crusading either against something or, or for something. Now, what has the campaign been against? Always for something. Well, what's it been for, then? For any kind of new great work which is coming along. I mean, we have, after all, found and helped a good many great artists in various arts. We really have, you know. And against cruelty, against injustice, against snobbery. Well, now, it, it's sometimes said about you, and I'm going to put it to you, that uh, in doing all this, you've deliberately courted a great deal of publicity. Is that true or not? I lose publicity. When we were young, we tried to teach people their manners. For instance, with my brother Osbert's first novel, he happens to have a most magnificent profile. And some persons, critic, I ask you, writing about the novel, said that he had the profile of a Hottentot. We quoted that. We also quoted, as far as I remember, something was said about me, that I was as ugly as modern poetry. It seems to me to have nothing to do with one's work at all. And we quoted those things not in order to, to get publicity, but in order to teach people their manners. We thought they might be ashamed. They weren't. You haven't ever quite honourably and sensibly sought to use publicity in order to further the causes that you have at heart? I don't think that I have. Have you ever tried purposely to avoid it? I have tried in every way to avoid a personal publicity. Since I was of a certain age, I mean, when I was young, I didn't care so much, you know what I mean? People made fools themselves, all right, they made fools themselves. Since I've been, since I was very young, I have avoided it. You have succeeded in attracting a good deal of attention, one way and another, even outside your works of poetry, wouldn't you agree? Yes, but that isn't my fault. Um, <laughs> you were once described, I think by Raymond Mortimer, but my memory may be at fault there, you were once described, however, as being a dangerous Bolshevik, terror of the colonels, and horror of the golf clubs, and causing panic among dog lovers everywhere. Now, in recent years, I suspect that you really have become a member of the establishment, although you enjoy yourself. Oh, no, I've not. You've not? No, 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 no. In spite of having four honorary degrees at various universities and being a dame? Yes. Uh, well, how can you be a dame and not be a member of the establishment? Because it has nothing to do with it. I mean, I shall always be the same kind of poet. Do you enjoy the honours which have been showered on you? Yes, intensely. You do this rather curious and unusual thing, I believe, of listing separately the various degrees that you have. You, 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 you write yourself down as De Mede said for D-Lit, 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 this is correct, isn't it? Naming each of the three degrees, which is unusual. Now, why do you do that? I did it at one moment because when I was having impertinence from various stupid young men, I thought it might perhaps put them in their places. And did it, in fact, succeed in doing that or not? Oh, well, they always get, uh, get put in their places and then they come on again, you know, one slaps them again and then they come on again. So. Now, you have taken, you referred to it yourself a moment ago, a particular pleasure all through your life, I think, in spotting young talent and helping young people yes. on. Uh, is that because you feel you didn't get the help that you required yourself when you were young? No. Is it just because you like the company of young people particularly? It is because I have a passion for the arts. Yes, uh, uh, but not necessarily a passion for young people as well, because you have been particularly li diligent, have you not, in seeking out and helping Oh, well, young. I always have a tenderness for the young. But uh, I don't encourage young people because they're young. If somebody of 60 came along who was a genius, I should just as much wish to help him or her. Do you, in fact, find it very easy to make close personal friendships, or do they come home? Yes. When I die, I will be able to say that I think that I've had, that I've given more devotion and had more devotion than most people I know. Uh, are, are most of your friends in the world of arts and letters, or are they of, of all every kinds? kind? Of every kind. Um, in the world of the arts, poor people, rich people, uh, people who've been ill treated, people who've been happy. Have every you, kind yes. of person. Have you ever, I hope I may ask this, 
seriously contemplated marriage? Well, that I think I can't answer. No reason indeed why, no. why you should at all. Do you consider looking at young people today, as so many of whom you've helped, that the standard of taste and behavior among the young uh, is lower than it used to be? Is this story of the depravity of the beat generation true? Well, you see, I think you said that I was a forbidding old lady. Well, I'm very forbidding. No young person would ever dare misbehave themselves in my presence. And I can think of one very great example of a very great poet who died some time ago. I never once saw him behave in any way that a great man shouldn't behave. Would you tell me who that was? I can guess, and I think it would be nice to... Dylan would, Thomas. Dylan Thomas, who was, was indeed one of the people you very much helped, yes. did you not? And he behaved always impeccably in my presence. Now, I want to change the subject and ask you about something quite different, because there was one episode in your career which has puzzled a lot of people. Why did you decide some years ago to go to Hollywood and work in the Hollywood machine? Well, I was not working in poetry at the moment, and I needed to earn money. Uh, did Hollywood uh, either succeed in or even seek to lower your standards? Oh, not for a moment. How did you ward them off? Because they have, after all, corrupted a great many. I didn't people. have to. I only saw people who, whose behavior was impeccable, who were highly educated, and the sort of people I would know in England. Is the story uh, uh, of your uh, affection for, or whatever it was, uh, Marilyn Monroe, just a, a press story, or is it true? Did it really happen? Well, I'll tell you what happened exactly. You see, she was brought to see me in Hollywood. And I thought her a very nice girl. I thought that she had been disgracefully treated, most unchivalrously treated. If people have never been poor, perhaps they don't know what it is like to be hungry. That girl allowed a calendar to be made of her, you see. Well, there have been nude uh, models. models before now. It means nothing against a person's moral character at all. This poor girl was absolutely persecuted by people. I mean, she has or had an unfortunate attraction for an extremely unpleasant kind of man, whom she avoided assiduously. I have seen her do that when she was brought to see me. I, mean, I, I really did, you see. I mean, she behaved like a lady. And has she shown pleasure and, 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 and gratitude, if you like, for the kindness which you showed to her? Well, indeed, yes. I mean, when she and her husband, for whom I have a very great admiration, came to London, they were asked who they wanted to see, and I was one of the first people whom they wanted to see, and they came. But, of course, we couldn't talk, because every kind of person was just hanging about outside and interfering and all the rest of it, you know, and going and telling lies afterwards. But I saw them again alone in New York, and we had a most delightful talk and I hope that one day I shall see them alone again. Now, you do visit America pretty regularly nowadays, and I want to ask you, do you find that the American way of life is a good one for an artist? Oh, yes. Why? Well, I mean, unless one is rushing about screaming, which I, I don't know anybody who does rush about screaming. You see, it is... Uh, there are certain comforts which prevent you from being harassed the whole time. That, I think, is a very good thing. You see, such as you, I mean, everybody, excepting the very, very poor, have ice boxes and have motors and... Yes, but with all that mechanization and all the sort of speed with which accompanies it, do you not find that the contemplation which is necessary for your work rather disappears? No, I've always been able to work perfectly. And do the Americans treat you with the respect, or do they treat artists with the respect that, they, that, that is their due? Oh, my goodness me, yes. They're perfectly wonderful audiences. Would they're, you so, they're so kind. I mean, for instance, after we had had a performance uh, somewhere or other, our photographs were put in the paper. We were not seeking publicity, but I mean, they were put in. And a week afterwards, some young people saw my eldest brother and me standing on a street corner waiting for a taxi, and they ran and got a taxi for us. Are you as well known in, in New York and, and San Francisco as you are in London? Do people recognize At you? At least. Yes. Do you ever want to be unrecognized as you go about your life? Uh, I want, uh, frankly, not for people to come up and bother me about every kind of trivial thing. 
Has it ever occurred to you, I'm sorry to come back to something, but has it ever occurred to you that if you did just once dress like Garbo in an old Macintosh and a slouch hat, you would go unrecognised? Ah, uh, no. I shouldn't. You'd rather not pay that price for it? Oh, I should hate to do it. I don't see why I should, because people are impertinent. Is it your experience that on the whole people are impertinent with the public figures whom they know well and, and, and love? Not everybody. Some are most considerate, but some are extremely impertinent. Well, now... I um, mean, anybody thinks that they have a perfect right to come up and bother me about their own uh, problems. Problems, yes. Well, now, somebody did once write about you, Dame Edith. Not what she writes, but what she is exerts the real fascination. And that's what I've been trying to find out tonight. Now, before I give you the last word, I want you to listen to three most lovely lines which I quote from one of your own poems. The great sins and fires break out of me like the terrible leaves from the bough in the violent spring. I am a walking fire. I am all leaves. Amy, what is that great fire? What is the living thing which all your life has been trying to break out of you? The great fire, I suppose, is a humble but unworthy love of God and certainly a great love of humanity. And the, uh, to be an artist is a terribly painful scene. I mean, the great leaves uh, break out of me. You see, one has a perpetual resurrection in one's life as the art returns to one after long deadness. And, of course, the fire's always fighting with sins, and, well, there one is. Evelyn Waugh is face to face with John Freeman next Sunday at five past eight in the interview of 1960, which provided a rare insight into the life and temperament of this great novel.